Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our special coverage from the World Economic Forum. I'm Francine Lacroix here live in Davos, day four. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Fresh tensions in the Middle East as Pakistan carries out strikes on militant groups inside Iranian territory in retaliation to similar attacks by Tehran yesterday. Pakistan's prime minister cuts short his time in Davos to return to Islamabad. Traders wind back bets on aggressive monetary easing this year after strong U.S. retail sales cast out on a dovish Fed in March. Plus, coming up from Davos this hour, interviews with the head of Meta's global business group, the director general of the IAEA, the international chief executive of Goldman Sachs, as well as a Carlyle Group co-founder. But let's start in the Middle East, where tensions are escalating, this time between Iran and its nuclear-armed neighbor, Pakistan. Now, the Pakistani military says it's carried out strikes on military groups inside Iranian territory. This was in retaliation to similar attacks by Tehran yesterday. Pakistan's prime minister has cut short his time here in Davos and is returning home to deal with the unfolding crisis. We are delighted to be joined by John Doyle, chief executive of Marsh and McLennan, a global leader in risk management, but also a broker in insurance. So the uh, Mr. John Doyle understands risk. You understand also premiums that need to be paid to go through the Red Sea. Are you worried that this escalates? And good morning. Good morning, Francine. It's great to be with you. Yes, I'm quite worried about the recent escalation of the last couple of days and, and the potential for further escalation. And as a risk advisor, geopolitical risk really is at the top of, of the agenda this week and the conversations we're having with both the public sector and the private sector. Um, and that one of the roles that we play is helping clients understand what that means for their supply chain risk, right. how geopolitical events may uh, impact cyber risk, and then, of course, in shipping as well. And that's a, a major challenge at the moment. And so what happens to shipping in this kind of environment? Again, how many percentage of, of boats will actually have to go around to make sure that they're safe and they can actually have insurance? Yeah, insurance, of course, is a critical enabler to the shipping industry all over the world. And it's not just the Red Sea. We've seen challenges, of course, with the war in Ukraine mm -hmm. around the Black Sea drought conditions in the Panama Canal, um, but specifically to the Red Sea, you know, the insurance markets in, in great turmoil at, um, currently, um, prices have increased very significantly, in fact, up about 10 times. But many shippers aren't even willing to, to expose, of course, their their people or, for that matter, the vessels or the cargo. And so that's requiring shipping to head down different paths and different routes. And so it's critical for business leaders um, to scenario plan in this type of environment. But see, so when I speak to investors, a lot of them say, well, we don't know how to scenario plan. And so they largely ignore the risk. You, you know, operate in a different space. What are chief executives doing to try and mitigate this risk? Well, we're trying to work with our, our clients in getting in front of this risk, um, understand where the risk lies, understand where the risks aggregate do some scenario planning and if possible, mitigate the risk in advance. And as it relates to shipping, it's going to require different routes in many cases. But this means a, a lot more expensive. Are a lot of your, you know, the chief executives that you advise in this space just allocating a lot more money to get goods from A to B? I think they're, they're trying to better balance yeah. Uh, resilience with efficiency. Um, it worries me a bit about um, the economic conditions where, you know, I think there's broad optimism here about the economy in 2024, but there are so many risks out there and the risk of inflation from things like um, shipping costs and delays in getting goods to markets is a concern that I have. Yeah, I mean, 2023 was, you, you know, in many ways showed a resilient economy, but we saw also really pockets of huge conflict and tension. One of them was what happened in the Black Sea with grains. You were part of the accord. Again, I don't know whether there's a template to try and de-escalate these situations. There is, you know, I'm very proud of the work that we did with the government of Ukraine to get, to fundamentally get grain moving again moving, through the yeah. Black Sea. It's such a critical part of their economy. So while at war, um, trying to enable the resilience of the Ukraine, you know, is a, a really important thing. And so we worked with the government there, put some structure together, and it's a public-private partnership. And, you know, we, we've seen war risks before, and we've yeah. advised around it. And so, you know, there are possibilities, of course, and lessons that have been learned that we can apply to the Red Sea. How much do you worry about 2024? There's elections. We talk about disinformation. We're not sure where AI is going. There's climate change. There's conflict. 
Well, I'm, I'm positive about 2024. Um, having said that, and I look back to a year ago when yeah. we had a similar conversation, I thought um, there maybe have been uh, too much pessimism a year ago. I worry that folks are a little bit um, too optimistic today. And again, I think they need to be, business leaders need to be aware of where those risks are. And it's not just geopolitical risk, economic risk, the risk of inflation yeah. we were just talking about, um, technology risk with the advent of AI and cybersecurity, of course, um, continues to escalate. Um, so I'm I'm worried about those risks. And so we need to be prepared for a broader range of outcomes. And again, thinking about risk and putting it at the top of mind is critical. Does it mean that chief executives will you know, become leaner in terms of how they operate? So cost cuts, probably job losses, again, because it's uncertain. It is, and I think it's always uncertain, right? At this time of year, you're never quite sure how the economy is going to evolve. But the complexity of the moment with these meta risks today is really what sets today apart from, you know, from recent years. So um, I, a number of CEOs that I've spoken to are entering 2024 a bit more defensively with a level of optimism. And so being agile in this kind of environment is critical and preparing for that agility and scenario planning is important. I guess always everyone's concern is that, you know, there's a survey, we have the risks and then something pops out of nowhere, yeah. like, like we saw in the last three to four months. Can you identify, you know, a potential black swan? I don't know whether it's something in the markets, liquidity, or the, something that actually you're looking out for that we're not talking about. No, I, look, I think between geopolitical risk, um, economic risk, again, the, the risk of inflation, climate-related risk, of course, can create um, all sorts of challenges. Um, labor risk, I think tight labor markets, social issues are critical in some of All right. <laughs> tight labor market and? <laughs> but the thing that I worry about mostly in 2024 with the explosion of AI is a misinformation risk and what that might mean to elections. You see, we have people popping in. What, you know, this this is we what happens in Davos. We have to be agile. John, a great conversation. Thank you so much, Thank as you. always, for joining us. John Doyle, chief executive there of March McLennan. Coming up, generative AI is dominating discussions at Davos. We'll be hearing from the head of Meta's global business group, Nicola Mendelssohn. That's coming up next. That's a conversation you don't want to miss as well. This is Bloomberg. Pulse, everyone. The rise of generative artificial intelligence has dominated discussions at the World Economic Forum this week. Now, the issues of accuracy, regulation, and also how to make it pay are among the key areas being debated. Now, to understand some of this, or not all of this, we're joined by Nicola Mendelssohn, head of global business group at Meta. Welcome also to our Bloomberg Radio audience. Nicola, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, a lot of people are asking a lot of questions about AI. A lot of people are excited about this shiny new object. Not many people understand it. You do. What will be the most transformational force from AI at Meta this year? Oh, so many things. And you're right. It, it's a really a big conversation here this week at Davos. Um, in many ways, this could be called the, the AI conference this time. From our side, from a meta perspective, Mark's been a real pioneer in this area. And we've actually, I mean, we set up uh, FAIR, our fundamental AI research lab, over a decade ago. And AI has been at the heart of meta since the very early days of Newsfeed. So we're using it in a number of different ways. We use it on the ranking, so the things that you're seeing in your newsfeed. We use it on the monetization side as well, in terms of connecting the, the very best ad to the right person for the advertiser. But yes, things have changed dramatically in the last year. So we're now imagining a world where you can have personal assistants. And from a meta perspective, we think you're not just going to have one assistant. We think you're going to have multiple assistants that can help you in various different aspects of your life. So there's many different areas. And then I think about how it's changing um, the advertising side of things. Mm -hmm. And last year, we brought together all of our um, advertising properties that are using AI yep. into Meta Advantage Suite. And the performance that we're seeing here for our advertisers, an increase on average of about 32% on a return on yeah. ad spend and a decrease on a cost of acquisition of about 17%. And advertisers are using at least one of these products now, so there's a lot of momentum. So, Nicola, how do you actually transform it into business? How do you monetize on this? Yeah, well, that's a very good example in terms of uh, how advertisers are using it, in terms yeah. of, I think of it like easy buttons. Okay. So in the past, um, what we're allowing advertisers to do now, it might have taken them 15, 20, maybe 30 steps to set up a campaign. Mm -hmm. You can do it in one button now. 
and we can find people that you might not have thought wanted to buy your product and put that advertising in front of them. That, that's one aspect. Another aspect is actually on the creative generation side. And so we're putting the tools right in the hands of the smallest and the biggest advertisers in the world to be able to change the background of the advertising, change the copy, uh, change the dimensions. So these are, again, all things that are cost saving. So it's not just about how to make money, but it's also about how you can actually reduce costs uh, in terms of the number of steps that something might have taken. So is it fair to say that men has gone from metaverse to AI? No, we're doing both. <laughs> you can't have a metaverse without AI. I mean, AI is very much the building blocks, whether it's on the hardware side where the new Quest 3, the, the, you know, the fact that we have mixed reality now, that relies on some really deep AI machine learning in order to bring together the physical world and the digital world. And of course, the, the building blocks of the metaverse in terms of... But it's disappeared from Davos. Have you been asked about metaverse? I'm talking about it all the time. I did a main stage panel on it. And actually, we're seeing more and more business use cases of it uh, as well. We're seeing it being used in supply chain. Pfizer are using it in their supply chain training. A lot of training. Uh, we're certainly seeing a lot of things on education as well. Uh -huh. And the three-dimensional aspect and the co-creation of it, many different companies taking that up at this time. It, there's a massive challenge this year against, I guess, misinformation, fake news in an election year, because it's probably more important than ever. We have more than 50 percent of world GDP citizens going to the polls. Are, are you confident that, that you will be able to minimize fake information on your platforms? Look, the, the elections is a really important area for us and protecting the integrity elections is something that we've been working on for many, many years. And we're not just waiting for 24. I mean, there's big elections all the time all over the world. And as the technology is advancing, so too we're refining our, you know, the playbook that we have. We've got very clear policies. We published in November that we're going to be always on uh, in 24 in the US, but it's not just the US, as you say, and it's India, Indonesia yeah. as well. So we've got the policies. We work with over 90 fact checkers around the world when it comes to misinformation. And then on political advertising, it's labeled, you yeah. can see, and then it goes into an ads library. And we now have over 15 million images that anybody can go and have a look and see what's out there. Will, will you hire more? fact checkers because it's it's such I guess you know a, a lot is at stake in a big election year yeah no so we already have 90 and yes yep. that is something as we're looking at where other elections are happening yes it's something that we're actively looking at um, can you give me an update also the European Union is actually enforcing some of you know the competition content rules try and rein in big tech I think you have until March 6 to comply will you be ready yes absolutely I mean we, we take our responsibilities in terms of how we work with regulators and new regulation very seriously so yes it absolutely we intend to do that. I mean, so, so AI, and it's really fascinating walking around Davos because so many people are excited about it. So many people say, look, we need to regulate it. We always need to put the human at the front of it. Do you have any concerns that if AI goes unchecked, we don't really know what, what it becomes and, and what it means for job losses, what it means for um, how humans interact? Yeah, so I think like with any new technology, you need regulation, but you also need thoughtful regulation that can enhance the innovation behind that. So that's why we like to work with regulators around the world so we can share different opinions and you know bring those conversations in there. I think that's also important. So what will we see this year concretely, you, do you think, around the world? There, there could be another global AI summit. Does, does those things matter, or do you need to look at it more from a business perspective? Look, I think it's really important. Look, we're not going to wait around for the regulation to come into play. We're already going to get a, a ahead of it. So we're building in responsible AI into every single one of the products that we're creating, very much learning from the work that we've done with privacy. And the whole safety aspect of things, we now have around 40,000 people yeah. at the company that are working on these sorts of issues. And it's an area where we spent over $20 billion to ensure the safety of you know, the products that we're putting out there. So we're going to keep working on this anyway. We're going to keep ensuring yeah. that we're thinking about these issues right from the very beginning. Yeah. But ultimately, this works best when we can work as an industry together and also, yeah. obviously, with regulators. How's Threads going? Oh, it's very exciting. Is, oh, yeah. It's, it it's a source of revenue yet? No, no, it's not. It's exceeded our expectations. We already have 100 million people that are enjoying it and using it. And we just recently launched it in the EU as well. We're bringing in more and more products all the time. We're seeing great engagement on there, but no plans to monetize just yet. OK, you'll have to come back and tell us when you do, Nicola. No, I will. Thank you so much, <laughs> Nicola Mendelssohn, their head of global business group at Meta. Now, coming up, we'll also be joined by Rafael Grossi, director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency. So we'll discuss nuclear proliferation and the risks facing the world. That's coming up next. And this is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Davos. A recent report by the UN's nuclear watchdog revealed that Iran is speeding up its enrichment of uranium to a level close to weapons grade. Now, Tehran's push for high-grade uranium comes at a time of huge tensions in the Middle East. So I'm joined by Rafael Grossi, Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Mr. Grossi, thank you so much uh, for joining us, as always. Now, you reported actually at the end of the December that Iran uh, tripled the rate at which it's accumulating uranium enriched close to weapons grades. How much material do you think they have now? Well, they, they have enough material uh, for uh, several nuclear war, warheads. This does mean they have them. Let me be clear about this. But it's not banal that uh, they have accumulated so much uh, enriched uh, uranium that this is a possibility. You may remember that a few years ago, people were saying, well, uh, it is two months, three months, five months that they would have enough material to, to do this. Now it's a reality. Uh, and this continues. As you were mentioning my, my report, we have seen that they are uh, speeding up the enrichment pace. Um, and of course, it's something they can do. But of course, we need to, to verify. But what are they doing with it? Well, this is, this is one of the questions. Uh, they are accumulating it. Uh, they, of course, say, and it's their right, they say that it's for civilian uh, purposes. But um, we haven't seen much in terms no. of that being used. It is, in fact, being stored. So uh, we also know that Iran is not actually you know, providing your inspectors with early design information. So is there a real danger that actually they're there preparing? Gaps. But so could they be preparing nuclear sites to put them online? Well, I would say uh, here we have to divide uh, very carefully what are activities that may have future implications from this taking place in real in 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 in, in reality. They they enrich. They they have um, a civilian nuclear program. They have uh, they produce. They fabricate centrifuges. Um, they do have uh, uranium mining and processing. So all the activities of the so-called nuclear fuel cycle are taking place. Our, the problem that we have seen is that there are many areas in which they have not clarified important uh, things that we have discovered in the yeah. past, which were not entirely clear for us. Why were we finding traces of uh, uranium in places that had never been declared as right. sites having hosted nuclear right. activities? So we are asking if there was material where it is, if there is, a, if there was equipment here, where is this equipment that we don't see? So it, it is, it is a very frustrating cycle of us asking questions and not getting the necessary uh, clarifications and answers really it's very simple so basically so you don't understand the nature of some of these sites or or it's we, it's we can think uh, the, what they were for but un until we clarify uh, we don't understand why why they, they they don't provide the necessary transparency I was there you may remember I saw president Raisi yes last March and, and, and the foreign minister and we had some understandings but unfortunately in the course of the year uh, this commitments never no. really were were, no. were uh, realized and, uh, and and here we are um, Director Gross, you were also in Saudi Arabia last year, and it's taking quite a lot of time for Saudi Arabia to implement some of the full-scope nuclear safeguards, yes. right, in order to generate atomic power. Yeah. Why is it taking so long? Well, the, the issue is that they don't have, at this point in time, the kind of activities that would require a very major comprehensive uh, inspection system. Uh, they have very, very minor activities. They have commissioned a low-power research reactor from Argentina. They haven't received it yet, but this is not a major facility. This is a small training facility. But they do have plans. Uh, they have uh, the idea, uh, which is perfectly fine with us, to have a, a, a big uh, nuclear energy program, like the Emirates, for mm -hmm. example. All right? uh, and this will require an adaptation. Mm -hmm. of the inspection system because they are going to have tons and tons of uh, uh, uranium and yes. nuclear material and so they will have to be inspected and this is I was in Riyadh like as you rightly said in December I was talking to the Minister of Energy to the Foreign Minister who, with whom I, whom I met here in Davos as you know he's yeah. here so uh, we have a very intensive dialogue with the kingdom at the moment uh, what's going on in Ukraine? I know there were questions, for example, of you know Russian nuclear plants in Belarus and whether they were safe. W were those There's safe? a number of things there. The first and most important is Saporizhia. 
Yeah. Saporizia is the biggest, largest nuclear power plant in Europe. Six reactors uh, yes. uh, there, six gigawatts yeah. of uh, installed in capacity. Ukraine. I in Ukraine, but in occupied territories. Yes. So Saporizhia, as you know, is part of this crescent, which is yeah. under Russian control. And the issue here is that this plant is at the front line yes. of the war. It's not uh, somewhere in the, in the province, it's at the front line. Of course, it's an active combat zone. So there's a lot of military activity taking place. There have been attacks in the past. This is why I deployed a team. I, yeah. I, I have been there myself. I will be returning there very soon. Okay. Um, we are trying to stabilize the situation there to avoid a nuclear accident with major radiological consequences. So this is the major thing. We have also, at the request of President Zelensky, mm -hmm. I have deployed teams in all other yeah. nuclear power plants uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, yeah. and they are checking that nothing uh, bad happens there. Director Grossi, thank you so much for joining us. Rafael Grossi thank there, you. the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Coming up, we'll be speaking to the Chief Executive of Goldman Sachs International. This is Bloomberg. Now, fresh tensions in the Middle East as Pakistan carries out strikes on militant groups inside Iranian territory in retaliation to similar attacks by Tehran yesterday. Now, Pakistan's Prime Minister cuts short his time in Davos to return to Islamabad. Meanwhile, the U.S. launches another round of strikes on Yemen's Houthis as the Iran-backed group continues to disrupt global shipping with attacks around the Red Sea. And traders wind back bets on aggressive monetary easing this year as strong U.S. retail sales cast doubts on a dovish Fed in March. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our special coverage from Davos. This is The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix. Now, investors banking on the coming year to see an easing of monetary policy as inflation moves closer to target. For the world's investment banks, the hope will be that cheaper money helps revive dealmaking after a dismal 2023. Well, to discuss this and more, we're joined by the chief executive officer of Goldman Sachs International Business. He's Richard Nodder. Richard, as always, thank you so much for making us smarter on how you see the world and the kind of deals that we could see in the future. Future. There was a mismatch in IPOs, I guess, in M&A last year that buyers were expecting too much and, well, buyers didn't want to spend as much as actually sellers want to pay for. Does it correct this year? We're getting closer. Look, let's take ourselves back to this time last year. Yeah, the view was pretty pessimistic. You know, this time last year, the expectation was a recession in the U.S. and there was a reasonably gloomy outlook. Of course, the markets performed much better than that and you know, with the, we know the US market was up you know, 23, 24 percent. So strong performance. And we also carried into last year assets that had been, that had been purchased at much higher prices. So there was clearly that difference in, in bid offer. I think people you know, worked through last year. We've made a lot of progress and I think we're getting, we're getting closer. I think there's still a gap. Yep. So I wouldn't expect you know, this year to be back full, full throttle, but yep. we're getting closer. How concerned are you about 2024? So we had a resilient economy in 2023. Now we're talking about conflicts, geopolitics. I mean, the news this week was escalating tensions. How does it play through markets? Well, there are two questions there. You know, first, the economics. And I think we feel better about the economics. I think we've got... We've got more of a tailwind this year than a headwind, which was, which was really last year's story. You know, rates are going to come down. There's a lot of debate when, how quickly. You know, clearly, the central banks around the world are you know, trying to slow the expectations down a little bit in terms of, in terms of rate cuts and the speed and, yep. and when they begin. Mm -hmm. But, but that's, going to be, that's going to be a tailwind. It depends when it, when it, when it kicks in. Your know, markets are at healthy levels. Mm -hmm. The European economy is going to be back to growth. You know, no expectation really of a recession in the US. So, so I think economically, we feel in a much better place. The geopolitical discussion, so this is not new, of course. This has been going on for the last you know, couple of years. The issue is that the list keeps getting longer. You know, we started with Russia, Ukraine, then we had the tragedy of October 7th. We've got you know, what's been going on you know, this week in terms of expanding into you know, these renewed strikes. More and more countries you know, getting involved. And, and that is, of course, a real, real concern. You know, markets would like to see the list of issues shrinking as opposed to growing. They're growing right now. Yeah, well, what are your employees telling you? So I know this is a, a hot year for uh, bonuses. What can you tell them? Well, yeah, we always we pay for performance. What is really, really important to us is that we have the best team in the field. We feel terrific about the team that we've got. The strategic focus of the firm is as good as it's ever been. We've got two significant pillars, both of scale. 
And at the end of the day, the success of that strategy depends on the quality of our people. So we're very focused on keeping you know, the best people at the firm, working together. The global footprint that we've yeah. put together over the last four decades probably you know, is a key differentiator for us. And our people feel good. They like the focus of the yeah. firm. They like the scale that we have and the leadership positions we have in our business. And we'll, we'll play the ball at our feet. You know, there's going to be unpredictable moments this year. There's going to be uncertainty. There are going to be issues that come across our plate that we haven't foreseen. With the best people, the best team working together, you can deal with those. So, Richard, I mean, there was a point where Goldman, of course, was almost in the eye of a storm. And we don't really hear about that anymore. Do you think that's, that's like a thing of the past? Strategic clarity is a fantastic thing, and I think we've, we've got that. And I think as we you know, close the chapter on 23 and move into 24, it's all about execution, continuing to build scale in these businesses, and that's what our people are focused on. Where do you see the best growth actually coming from your regions? Well, it's interesting. I was, in, I was in Asia last week. It was terrific to be in, in Japan. A lot of enthusiasm around Japan. And I think we'll spend a lot more time talking about Japan as we, as we go through this year. You know, they're going to have to think through the, a change in monetary policy. Yeah. Yeah. And inflation is back there. And it's, when you go there, you're just reminded of the, the scale of the manufacturing capability, the scale of that economy. It's, it's going to be an important market to focus on. Of course, India is terrific. Everybody we talk to is doing more in, in India. We're doing more in India, so I think that'll be, you know, that'll be interesting. But then, of course, in you know, the big two developed markets, the US and Europe, yeah. activity in the capital market side, we expect to pick up. You know, it'll be at a steady pace, yeah. maybe not back to peak levels, but it'll be better than it was, we expect, um, 24 than, 20, than, than 23. Capital markets do not stay shut forever. You know, they, they reopened at the back of last year. They'll continue to reopen. That's our belief. So are there pockets where you actually see, see hiring to actually make up for maybe some of the strength that you were talking about in certain specific businesses or regions? We, you know, we, we hire every single year. You know, we, we're hiring 3,500 people or so from campus. And we do that year in and year out. It's really important to continue to feed the machine and, you know, and build the next generation. So that we're always doing. And then, of course, laterally, we bring, bring people in to drive certain pockets. You know, our asset wealth management platform, broadly defined, is a huge focus for us. And so you know, that will receive significant attention. So you won't believe the number of bankers that are, are not happy about Basel, that are not happy about regulation. Is this top of mind as well? Is, it, is there a danger that actually what they put in place doesn't really make sense? Well, of course, we're in the middle of that process. Obviously, the comment period um, ended this week. Yeah. Um, it's been interesting to me to just see you know, the broad range of input that's come into this, because it's, it's not just the banks that are talking about this. It's the end users that are talking about this. And, and of course, that's really important. And you know, some of those end users are in the asset management space, but it's the real economy. You know, it's, it's the airlines. It's you know, users of the products you know, that we help them hedge. Uh, and if costs go up there, that impacts the real economy, and it's, it's, it's important. And, yeah, and the outpouring of commentary has been striking. Yeah, and so, but I mean, could it actually lead to, I don't know if it's a, a, some kind of a financial event or maybe not systemic, but is there really worry that the, the market changes um, and, and seizes parts of it? Yeah, there's a good dialogue. Okay. Uh, and the dialogue is, is open. If you look at some of the co commentary that's been coming out of the, from the leadership of the Fed, yeah. um, and obviously no one's predicting an endpoint, you know, yeah. there's still a work to be done and there's a yeah. process to be gone through. I would exp there are some smart people looking at this, and in the end, people typically get to a smart place. You're an optimist. <laughs> okay, Richard. Thank you so much, Richard Nade, our Chief Executive Officer of Goldman Sachs International Business. Now, coming up, after a dearth of deals in 2023, will this year see a revival in M&A? We'll also be speaking private equity with the co-founder of the Carlyle Group, David Rubenstein. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everyone. Now, last year was the worst for mergers and acquisitions in a decade. Dealmakers say 2024 is already looking more positive. Now, for more on this, I'm delighted to be joined by the Carlisle co-founder and co-chairman, David Rubenstein. David, thank you for joining us. Now, My pleasure to be here. I don't know whether last year was so bad because there was just a mismatch between the price people wanted to pay and the ones that actually they wanted to sell. And does that get adjusted this year? 
Well, last year the problem was interest rates were very high. And uh, sellers were afraid that if they sold uh, to somebody, they probably weren't going to get the price they wanted because buyers didn't want to pay the price because interest rates were high. Uh, and buyers were afraid that they were going to buy into a recession. Yep. They thought the recession might come, right. they'd look stupid by buying it or something and it goes into recession. Now the recession fears are gone. Interest rates are coming down almost certainly very soon. So I think you'll see a lot more M&A activity and a lot more private equity activity. Are you expecting six Fed cuts? I mean, that seems excessive. I think trying to predict what the Fed's going to do precisely is a fool's errand. Uh, the Fed's going to do what it does based on the data. But right now, I think the markets will be shocked if the Fed didn't cut before the election. Now, uh, the Fed will, I think, have political problems if they say we're going to do some cuts right around the time of the presidential election, because you can be sure Republicans would say you're just trying to help the Democrats. So they're going to get their cuts out of the way. They're going to meet in January, and then I suspect they're going to talk about what they're going to do in the March FOMC meeting. And I'd be very surprised if there isn't some cut by March. Yeah, but, but in terms of deal making, I mean, w would people not wait for the U.S. election to know who's in charge in the White House? Because that could change also uh, regulation, rules, foreign policy, everything, really. Well, there's no doubt that uh, the current antitrust enforcement is not uh, that favorable to a lot of bigger acquisitions. Mm -hmm. But private equity tends not to be doing things that the antitrust officials care about that much because they kind of stand alone acquisitions. So that's not been a big problem for, for people. It's really been the interest rates and the concern that there might be a recession coming. But I think that concern is gone. We've seen some big deals in private equity, especially in infrastructure with BlackRock buying GIP. We have Actis and General Atlantic. Is this, I mean, is this going to continue? Are we going to see a lot more of these already big, sizable deals? Well, the consolidation that's going on in private equity, I think, will continue. Um, the BlackRock deal is a, is a very good deal for BlackRock, I think, and a very good deal for uh, the, the firm that sold it to them. It's a very good firm. GIP is an excellent firm. Um, the high price, some people would say, but I think it will work out well for everybody. Um, I think you'll see more consolidation, particularly in infrastructure, because infrastructure is an area that people like, relatively predictable rates of return, and there's a lot of interest in, among investors in investing in that class. But yeah, I do think you'll see more consolidation, and some of the bigger firms will get bigger. But this is what, with infrastructure, because infrastructure is really what we need if we're going to build this new, new future, or private equity in general? Well, infra well, private equity in general, but infrastructure okay. is an, a class where a lot of the big private equity firms don't have a gigantic infrastructure business, so they might want to add to it. Okay. Some do have businesses that are big already. But our infrastructure is a very predictable business. It's a very okay. predictable rate of return business, and it's uh, one of the ones that I think a lot of investors increasingly think is a good area to invest in. Remember, in the administration uh, in, in, in the United States, the Biden administration has gotten a very big infrastructure bill through Congress, and a lot more infrastructure can be built in the United States, but that's true around the world. Um, David, do you worry about, you know, private equity, maybe some of the spaces that are smaller where they're in debt if actually interest rates don't go down quickly? Are, are some of the, the smaller companies in trouble, like real trouble? Well, there's always... Uh a way you can get attention by saying things are in trouble, things are falling apart. But right now, despite the fact that interest rates were so high and the economy was not wonderful for a while uh, post-COVID, uh, I think now we've seen relatively few bankruptcies and relatively few distressed debt opportunities. I think you'll see a lot of distressed debt opportunities in real estate because I think commercial real estate really hasn't seen the worst of probably the debt problem that's yeah. going to occur. But I think it's different in other parts of the private equity world. But, but why? So is it, is it a delayed effect or just it's more resilient than we thought it would be? Because the debt uh, in real estate and in corporate acquisitions is now often uh, what's called covenant light. Fine. So unless you actually default in paying the interest, you don't have the problems of the banks taking over the debt. So it's, it's easier to stay alive when things aren't working well than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Where are you seeing or where do you want to make deals? Well, where nobody else wants to make them. I want to find things that nobody else is looking at. There are a number of areas that I think are going to be attractive uh, in the future. Uh, one of the ones that people are talking about here is, of course, obviously, uh, artificial intelligence. Everybody wants to be in artificial intelligence. But another area that hasn't gotten as much attention, but I think will in the next couple of years, is something called quantum computing. Mm -hmm. Quantum computing will change computing dramatically by speeding up the way computers move uh, and, and make decisions and so forth. So I think that's an area that you're going to see a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, activity. I think CRISPR technologies are going to be an area where we see a lot of activity in the future, a lot of biotech related things, mm -hmm. computational biology, um, data science. There will be a lot of areas that I think you'll see a lot of growth. But that needs more energy. Do you also invest in, in you know, some of the companies of tomorrow when it comes to energy or are there, is it too crowded? 
Well, energy is crowded in some respects. Right now, it's not crowded in the traditional oil and gas sector. Uh, right now, large institutional investors are a little nervous about investing in oil and gas, unfortunately, uh, in my point of view, because it's still something that we need. Now, obviously, everybody wants clean energy. Everybody wants to get, get rid of uh, uh, carbon emissions. But I think for the foreseeable future, at least during my lifetime, it's not likely we're going to go to carbon neutrality completely. But, so how do you look at AI? It's going to make us more productive. It's going to you know, stop us from, well, we don't have to learn PowerPoint anymore, which is only a beautiful and good thing. But where do you want to be invested in? Well, AI, the big issue is, are you going to be better off investing in the small startup AI companies, or are you going to be better off investing in the Microsofts and the Googles? Who's going to do better? Nobody really knows yet. But I do think there's opportunities in both places. There are a lot of AI companies. In fact, every company I see in the venture space today says it's an AI company. So everybody says they're AI some way or shape or form. But, but, but this is not a bubble, right? This is not like the you know, Goldman Sachs.com era of like 2000, where everyone suddenly became an internet company. I would say that uh, bubbles, you, don't, you only know you're in a bubble when it bursts. So right now, it doesn't look like a bubble, but you know, people pay crazy prices for startup companies that have no revenue, uh, no prospect of, of revenue in the next four or five years. It's a problem. But I do think that you are seeing fairly high valuations in some artificial intelligence companies now. Maybe it'll turn out to be a bubble down the road, but everybody's afraid of missing out. You know, there's a great human tendency to be afraid of missing out on something. And so people are afraid they're going to miss out on the AI um, yeah. trend, and they don't want to miss out on it. So people are putting a lot of money in it, relatively high prices. So, so, so is that one of your, uh, I guess, investment advice? Don't, you know, don't have the fear of missing out, because you started by saying you want to be where no one else is. Well, as a general rule of thumb, you're better off to invest where other people aren't ra racing to go into it. Um, I don't want people to look at the things I'm looking at because then the price will go up. But clearly, uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in AI. And AI has, uh, a year ago when you were here and I was here, we weren't talking about AI as much. AI has really uh, been almost dominant in, in uh, Davos this time because everybody is worried about what AI is going to do. They want to make sure their company is uh, able to deal with AI or they're not going to be hurt by AI, but they also want to be helped by AI. Yeah, but how do you see it developing? I mean, I was just speaking to someone from Meta that was saying, you know, we'd have personal assistants to do, for example, I don't know, parent stuff and work stuff. That is, what, 10, 20 years away, or could it also just never come true? It's too hard to predict uh, 20 years down the road or even 10 years down the road or five years. Who would have predicted in, in, in 2000 that the Internet would change the world as we know it? At the point there, and in 1999, 2000, people thought the Internet was a big a bubble, yeah. and a lot of the companies went under. Right now, uh, the Internet has changed the way we live and, and probably yeah. will forever. Um, I suspect AI will have a big impact, but we don't really know. We're in inning one of a nine-inning game. But, but so, again, how, how do you make that investment choice then? <laughs> I don't want to give out all my investment secrets, but I would say that generally um, uh, you're looking for people that know what they're doing, that really have a desire to build a company, not just make money. You're looking for people that are going to work around the clock and actually have some technology knowledge. But you take a look at the great entrepreneurs of the last 20 years, you know, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos. What did they have in common? They walked through walls. They believed in what they were doing, and they had a passion that you couldn't replicate easily. And you know, obviously there was some luck along the way, but the great entrepreneurs are going to be you know, coming along in the next generation as well and probably will be an AI. David, thank you so much for joining us. Always interesting. Carlisle, co-founder there, David Rubenstein. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more, of course, from Davos. So we still have, well, we have the rest of today and then we have tomorrow. Much more. This is Bloomberg. Now, tensions escalating again in the Middle East, this time between Iran and its nuclear-armed neighbor, Pakistan. Now, earlier today, Pakistan's military carried out strikes against militant hideouts inside Iran. This was in response to an attack by Tehran in Pakistani territory on Wednesday. Now, Pakistan's interim prime minister is cutting short his time here in Davos and is returning home to deal with the unfolding crisis. Meanwhile, the U.S. launched another round of strikes on Yemen's Houthis overnight. So that's as the Iran-backed militant group continues to disrupt global shipping with attacks around the Red Sea. Now, in an interview with Bloomberg here in Davos, the UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron has suggested that stepping up sanctions against the Iranian regime if the Red Sea attack continue. We have 
delivered very tough messages to Iran, including I had a discussion with the foreign minister uh, last week. And obviously there's a number of sanctions and other measures already in place. But I think it's absolutely vital that we send a very clear and unequivocal message to Iran that its behavior in supporting these proxies, whether it's Hamas or Hezbollah or indeed the Iranian armed groups in, in Iraq and Syria, its behavior is unacceptable. And the opposition Labour Party says it supports the UK's decision to strike back against Houthi targets to stop further attacks in the Red Sea. Well, I spoke to the UK's shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves, yesterday. That was to, uh, to protect a maritime uh, uh, route and to protect the ships going through it and to send a very clear signal to uh, the Houthi rebels and also to Iran that we will not stand for this uh, disruption to, uh, to, to trade flows and, and these attacks on maritime uh, vessels. And uh, I think that was important that that happened. It had the full backing of the Labour uh, opposition as well as the backing of, of many countries around the world. Well, I also asked Reeves about Labour's plans for corporate taxation in the UK. Well, I think the corporation tax uh, is at a competitive level and it's incredibly important that British industry is competitive. I'm here in Davos to say to business that with a Labour government, we would be not just open for business, but actively encouraging investment and wealth creation in Britain and making the argument that Labour today are the party of wealth creation and we wouldn't do anything with tax to deter that investment. So does that mean that you could actually rule out increasing corporation tax, VAT and bank levy? Well, look, I'm not going to set Labour's tax uh, policy uh, on, a, on a television uh, programme, uh, but I think I've been very clear and very consistent. We want to give clarity to business and give them certainty that they can make those long-term investments. Yeah. And indeed, we would invest alongside business in some of the big growth opportunities that we see in our economy today. Right. But from what I've understood, definitely no corporation tax increase. Well, look, I'm not going to make that commitment on, on this programme, but we want a competitive uh, rate of tax and we want certainty for business. Well, the Unicredit chief executive, Andrea Orcel, also says he's certain to hit his profitability goals despite heightened geopolitical uncertainty. Now, here's a look back at our conversation a little bit earlier. We will give, obviously, an update with our Q4 or year-end results in uh, February. But uh, suffice to say that our strategy and our commitment has not changed. No. At the moment, you're looking at we have probably reduced by 70 percent our exposure yeah. there. It has costed us less than 10 or 15 percent yeah. of that. And we've done that in an orderly fashion, and we will continue to do that. Well, that, of course, was Unicredit's chief executive, Andre Orchel, speaking to me a little bit earlier today here in Davos at the World Economic Forum. Now, coming up later today, we'll be speaking to the Blackstone chairman and chief executive, Steve Schwartzman, the German finance minister, Christian Lindner. Also had interviews with the chief executives of Morgan Stanley and of Bank of America. That's coming up shortly. Up next, Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger in London, Manus Cranny in New York, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.